Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Laura Basilovac, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement. If you're a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. After the presentation, we will have some time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. <laughs> if you have difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. It is my great honor to introduce you to the Chancellor of the University of Kansas, Dr. Bernadette Gray Little. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to join you for the inaugural Elizabeth Dole Women in Leadership Lecture. Beginning today and in the years ahead, this event will highlight the contributions of women who break barriers, make significant contributions to their fields, and reach positions of leadership. Senator Elizabeth Dole knows a thing or two about that, as evidenced by her extraordinary and historic career over the past half century. And I cannot imagine a more fitting namesake or venue for this lecture series. In just a few moments, we're going to enjoy a conversation between Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey and Senator Dole. But first, it's my honor to introduce Senator Dole. A native of North Carolina, I'm just saying. <laughs> Elizabeth Dole did her undergraduate work at Duke University and pursued postgraduate work in education at both Harvard and Oxford. She earned a master's in teaching from Harvard and also a law degree from Harvard Law School, where she was one of only 24 women in her graduating class of 550. Senator Dole launched her career in public service in 1960 on the Kennedy-Johnson presidential campaign and subsequently served in the Johnson, Nixon, and Ford administrations. She was often among the first women, if not the first, to hold her positions, starting with her appointment to the Federal Trade Commission in 1973. She was later appointed by President Reagan to become the first female Secretary of Transportation. Because the Coast Guard was part of the Department of Transportation during her service, she has the distinction of being the first woman to head a U.S. military branch. Following this appointment, she served as Secretary of Labor under President George H.W. Bush, becoming the first woman to hold two different cabinet positions in two different presidential administrations. In these national leadership roles, Dole focused on public safety and health. As Secretary of Transportation, she is credited with the historic trifecta of regulations that went into effect on the same day in 1984. This resulted in safety belt use in 49 states, airbags in cars, and a national drinking age of 21. As Secretary of Labor, she focused on protecting Americans from workplace injuries and created initiatives that helped at-risk youth find employment. She negotiated a raise in the minimum wage and worked to encourage an economy characterized by high-skill, high-wage employment. Through these accomplishments, she was instrumental in the effort to break the glass ceiling for women in high federal executive positions. In 1991, she became president of the American Red Cross and the first woman to hold that position since the founder, Clara Barton, more than a century prior. Under her guidance, the Red Cross restructured after the chaos of blood donation during the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. And she was also instrumental, along with uh, others, in her husband's 1996 presidential campaign before running her own campaign for the Republican presidential nomination in 2000. Dole returned to her home state and in 2002 became the first woman to win North Carolina's Senate seat as well. In 2012, 
she founded the Elizabeth Dole Foundation to support military caregivers. Since the foundation's launch, she has led the way in exposing the military caregiving crisis and bringing crucial resources to help those uh, hidden heroes. Those of you who are of a certain age as I am will remember directly many of the things that I have mentioned that have occurred over the years. For our students and our younger guests, let me tell you, she is a woman you should emulate, a woman to whom you should look for inspiration, and a role model for how you can improve our society and pursue something bigger than yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the Dole Institute, Senator Elizabeth Dole. Well, Senator Dole, welcome back to the Dole Institute at the University of Kansas. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much. And I'm delighted to be back. And I have to say, Chancellor Gray Little, I have never had a more beautiful introduction. From my heart, I thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Bless you. And I'm just thrilled to be back. And I, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to be with the Chancellor today because I have such great respect and admiration for all of your achievements here at the University of Kansas and, of course, your strong support for the Dole Institute and being a fellow North Carolinian. <laughs> I happen to know a little bit about all the wonderful work you did at the University of North Carolina. Now, you realize that Duke, my alma mater, and Carolina are great rivals, but I was pulling hard for Carolina to win the NCAA championship, <laughs> and they did. So that may be the only time I'm ever pulling for Carolina in basketball. And of course, Kansas has a mighty good team, right? <laughs> but I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I just noticed, Senator, I haven't noticed this until right now, but uh, there's a card on these roses. I didn't know if you wanted to see it before we started. Do I need my glances? Oh my goodness. It says, Dear Elizabeth, congratulations on your is that special, on special your special day. date, love Bob. Oh, that is so sweet. I love that. He's a wonderful guy. <laughs> okay. We're ready to get started. We'll take care of that thing. Okay. You're okay. No thank problem. You but us. thank you. <laughs> Let's start off. Uh, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and what got you interested in public service to begin with. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, I grew up in Salisbury, North Carolina, a small town of about 25,000, and uh, wonderful parents who had no idea of having me go into a career. You know, when I finished Duke University, uh, they, my dad had bought a lot in Salisbury for me to build a house on. In other words, they wanted me to marry, settle down, live next door almost. And uh, when I told them that I really was interested in spreading my wings, I wanted to live in another part of the country, love the South, but having gone to school at Duke, and we had traveled quite a bit in other parts of the country, but I wanted to live in another part of the country and just maybe do some graduate work and uh, you know, spend some time with mobility to be able to travel and all. And so um, I lived in Boston for uh, several years, and lo and behold, I was uh, working at Harvard Law School and I became interested in going to law school because I was a political science major at Duke. I saw my uh, friends going into law school who had the same interests, the same background that I had. And the men that I was working for there at the law school said, why aren't you going to law school? And so gradually I began to think about doing this. My parents were visiting me and we were traveling in New England. And uh, so <laughs> one night after dinner, um, my parents and I were talking and I started sharing with them that I thought I'd really like to go to law school. Well, they did not understand this at all. You know, what, what, I think my mother thought she was losing her daughter. What is happening here that you want to go into law school? Well, um, I finally convinced them that I was really serious about it. And I remember there was a, we had uh, a suite where my bedroom, the bathroom, mother and dad's bedroom. 
In the middle of the night, unfortunately, my mother lost her dinner. She must have really thought she was losing her daughter. This upset it, it upset her so much because back in that time, it just really wasn't happening. And so I was uh, my first year in law school, uh, actually the first day of law school, one of my male classmates came up to me and said, Elizabeth, what are you doing here? What are you doing in this law school? Don't you realize there are men who give their right arm to be here? Men who would use their legal education. That man is now a senior partner in a Washington law firm. And every now and then, I tell that little story around town. In fact, Bill, I love to tell that story. <laughs> and these men will call up and say, tell me I'm not the one. Please tell me I'm not the one. I'm just going to let them all, Shade, I'm going to let them all sweat it out, OK? <laughs> but my parents ended up being very pleased with the decision, but it really took some doing. And I was uh, one of 24 women in a class of 550. So it really was uh, something that just people didn't think about doing it then. And now over 50% of the, uh, the uh, students entering Harvard are female. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so a lot of changes. But I'm not sure why I listened to the beat of a different drummer. I really don't know. I can't explain what caused that. But I just began to feel, with the encouragement of these two men, that yes, this would be great background for whatever I want to do. I knew I probably didn't want to practice with a law firm, but I was interested in, in public service. And uh, Margaret Shea Smith had told me that law was great background when I visited with her back in 1960. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in law school. Maybe she put that seed in my brain. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, you supported Jack Kennedy for president in 1960, and then you wound up being a Republican senator from North Carolina. Can you kind of describe <laughs> your... Your well, evolution. <laughs> I grew up, of course, in the South, and my dad was conservative. And he, um, he was a member of the Democratic Party because he felt at that time the only place he had a chance to cast a conservative vote was in the Democratic Party. The Republicans were a little handful. You could put them in a, in a phone booth at that time. So uh, gradually things began to change. And... Um, so I was still registered as a Democrat when I met my husband. And um, I remember he came over to take me out to dinner when we were dating. And there was a little article about my work in the consumer affairs movement. And uh, I didn't want to show it to him because the last line was that I was a Democrat. And I, I hadn't told him yet, you know. And so he said, oh, I want to see that. And I said, no, no, we're late for dinner. Let's go. We've got to see. Well, he insisted on reading it anyway, and sure enough, he said, you're a what? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think both of us, our, what we love is being bipartisan. We love being able to work with people on both sides of the aisle because you're not really going to get anything done unless you find that common ground. So I think both of us are sort of known for being people who work with the Democrats and Republicans to get things done. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's my stance now. I'm not uh, out there beating the flag. <laughs> okay. okay. What are some of the unique challenges that you faced uh, in various leadership positions because you were a woman? Hmm. Interesting question, because frankly, the challenges were not so much that I was a woman. Uh, just to give you an example of the Department of Transportation, it was a male bastion. And when I went to transportation, uh, I found that I was leading a workforce of 100,000 with 19% females. And my constituency was railroad engineers, air traffic controllers, pilots, and ship captains. You know, and it was, and actually, I think that um, the chancellor mentioned that uh, I headed the red, uh, the, uh, at the uh, transportation department, I headed the Coast Guard. I was the first woman to head a branch of the armed services because it was then listed, uh, it was, its home was in transportation. Later on, it was moved to Homeland Security. But very much a male uh, situation. But I never really thought about that. I mean, you know, if you have a, a fervor for what you're doing, and I told young people earlier today, find that which you feel passionate about, uh, and it'll, it'll give you the energy, it'll drive you forward. You'll put so much time and effort into it because you care about it, it's from the heart. And that will move you forward, and uh, other opportunities will open up. And that's sort of what happened with me. So I was following my star, and I was just doing what I really cared about. And, uh, and 
you know, it was not so much um, that there were uh, challenges because I was a woman. I do remember in the Reagan administration, it's the couple of years that I was in his White House, looking around one morning and thinking there are 32 uh, men and me at the morning staff meeting, you know. But we worked together. And uh, same thing happened at the Federal Trade Commission. There were five commissioners, four males and me. But I guess, you know, I was sort of used to that and just doing my thing and following my star. And, um, and I advise the young women today to find what you're passionate about. But women are moving forward in massive ways today, no question. Mm -hmm. But I, I was there on the cutting edge, I guess. You had uh, quite a few leadership positions during your career. Um, is there a favorite one, or are there two or three that really stand out to you? Well, uh, there's a, there's, I, I love them all. And people will ask you, you know, after you've left, do you miss the Transportation Department, or do you miss the Red Cross, or do you miss the Senate? I don't have time to miss any of them because I'm focused on the next challenge, you know, the next opportunity, hopefully, to make a difference for people. But I would say you could look at that two ways. One that I loved very much, and I enjoyed them all, and then maybe one that was the toughest. And I would say probably transportation was great because it really gave me an opportunity, uh, as the chancellor mentioned, to, to move forward with safety initiatives, with the airbags, uh, and, uh, and also with the seat belts. You know, at that point, only 13% of Americans were wearing their seat belts. And we had to, to provide cent incentives to the states to get them to pass seatbelt laws. Um, so we did that. We forced them to do it. Um, and then with airbags, uh, there's an interesting story there because uh, George Bush was our vice president, and President Reagan had appointed George Bush to head up a regulatory review task force. The number one item on that agenda for the automobile companies was no airbags. We do not want to produce airbags. Now, I become Secretary of Transportation, I'm thinking the one thing we really need is <laughs> airbags, right? That's your front, your front angular protection. You need the safety belt, but you also need that airbag if you're gonna save as many lives as possible as quickly as possible, and that was our goal. So um, I found out that President Reagan had a good friend out in, uh, at Northwestern University, a doctor, who uh, would be able to really articulate all of the accident material. What happens when you crash through a windshield, you know, unbelted? Uh, how many lives would be saved if we had airbags? And I got in touch with Paul Meyer, and I said, would you come to Washington? Because I'm going to President Reagan with this initiative, and I want you outside the White House door and if he, if he gives me any trouble on this in terms of how many people are killed or whatever, I want you to come in and give him all the statistics that you have. Let him know because he's a man who cares about helping people. And so Dr. Meyer agreed to come. And the president didn't know he was outside the Oval Office. And then we put a car with an airbag in the, law, in the uh, driveway there on, just off the lawn because you, it was very hard to find a car. There were only a few. There had been an experiment, and they had a few cars with airbags, but that was it. But we found one. So it was in the driveway, and Dr. Meyer was outside the door. And then as I talked to the president, I said, Mr. President, you know there are these blood borders. And this was on age 21 on the drinking rule, which was the third part of this trifecta. And I said, y young people are going to states with lower drinking ages. They're consuming alcohol. They're going back home, and many of them are being uh, injured or dying. We call them blood borders. And he said, Elizabeth, he said, if kids are dying, he said, you've got my support. I'll sign that legislation. You can go up and fight for it on the Hill. And then we talked about all the other uh, parts, the airbags and the seat belts, and he gave me his full agreement. And I never even had to call Dr. Meyer in. He never went out to see the, the car with the airbag. And that was, um, we've, today they tell us that about 400,000 lives have been saved because of the trifecta. And about 20,000 uh, each year is what they expect moving forward. Wow, that's true. So that's the joy of public service. <laughs> that truly is the joy of public service. And I think the toughest might be changing the blood program at the Red Cross, but that would be another long story.
Go ahead. Go ahead, share. You want me to yes, tell that please. one? Okay. Well, at the Red Cross, um, what I found was I, I came into the Red Cross in 1991, and it was the early 80s, if you all recall, when AIDS became an issue. And so the blood supply was very important, and Red Cross was providing half of America's blood supply, collecting, testing, and distributing half of the blood supply. And uh, I found that they were using a system that went back to World War II. It was still the World War II system when we started collecting blood, very decentralized in all the communities across America. But the Food and Drug Administration was monitoring, was regulating this blood supply. So obviously you need a standard operating procedures, you need a, a, a very state-of-the-art system. So it was a major, major undertaking that took us almost my whole time at the Red Cross and hundreds of millions of dollars. But I had gotten to know John Dingell, Congressman Dingell, well, because at uh, the uh, Transportation Department, it fell to my, uh, <laughs> my time there to sell a freight railroad, Conrail, the government's freight railroad. And John Dingell and I were on opposite sides of that issue. He did not want to sell the railroad. And I, my mandate was sell that railroad. <laughs> but we actually became friends over the process, even though we disagreed with each other. So I went to John Dingell, and I said, I need to go to my board at the Red Cross to get the approval to go through this blood transformation. And I said, but I need you, because I know you oversee the Food and Drug Administration. And so I'm going to David Kessler to get him in the boat, because when I go to the board, I want to make sure that the government is in the boat with us, and John, you're important in this process. So I think that's kind of how you, the people you meet along the way, you know, even if you're on opposite sides of an issue, you become friends, and later on you work together on another issue. And so we were able to get that done, but it was, uh, uh, we, I think we, we shut down about 53 testing labs and built about 15 brand new state-of-the-art testing labs, and uh, eight different computer systems were shut down, and one next generation computer, and of course the standard operating procedures. But very, very important in terms of the safety of the public. So traveling public and transportation, safety of all of us with the with blood uh, transformation. Those were, were two of the toughest and, and two of the most enjoyable mm -hmm. because it really made a difference for people. Mm -hmm. We first met when uh, you were assistant to president and director of the White House Office of Public Liaison. Oh, and and I, <laughs> was was a little, I was a little bitty staff guy in the political <laughs> office uh, with Ed Rollins. But uh, tell us what President Reagan was like from your perspective and how you enjoyed working for him, not only on his senior staff, but also on his cabinet. Right. Well, President Reagan was an incredible human being. Um, and I'll never forget, though, there was a time when, you know, you're very rarely alone with the president. I mean, there's always some staff person nearby. But we were alone. We were waiting for him to give a speech. And I just couldn't resist. I said, Mr. President, I said, you know, you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders. And yet you are, you're always so gracious, so kind, so thoughtful. You know, I've never seen you really get irritated and furious and yelling at somebody. I mean, you're just gracious all the time. And I said, how in the world do you do it? And he kind of leaned back in his chair. And he had this way of speaking. He said, well, Elizabeth, when I was governor of California, does that remind you of yes, it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, Elizabeth, when I was governor of California, he said it seemed like every day someone would come forward and put yet another disaster on my desk. And I had, they handed me another disaster. And he said, you know, I tended to give it to someone behind me to help me. And he said, one day I realized I was looking in the wrong direction. I looked up instead of back. And he said, I'm still looking up. I couldn't go another day in this office if I didn't know I could ask God's help and it would be given. So he was a man of faith. He didn't talk about it a lot, but uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful person. And when I left the cabinet, he not only gave me my cabinet chair, and we've got to figure out where to put it. I don't know if it's going to come here or what we're going to do with it. You have a place for a chair? Yeah. We but, <laughs> but he also, he also had a, a party for you. And we talked about the fact that I said, Mr. President, you're so nice to have this good farewell party. And I was leaving, you know why? To campaign for Bob Dole for president. 
<laughs> That's why I was leaving his cabinet in 1957, or 87, excuse me. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, how about if we, there, there's some young kids who would so love to meet you. There's a young man who's disabled in my hometown of Salisbury, North Carolina. And I said, would it be all right with you, instead of having people that you see all the time at this party, could I invite people who might never have a chance to meet the president? He said, absolutely do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And it was wonderful. There was a little girl who was in the, uh, uh, give, what is it, Save a Wish or Give a Wish? It's an organization. Make a Wish. Make a wish. Right, and she had wanted to meet the president. And so, and he had had me visit with her uh, in uh, Kentucky, I think, because he had not been able to meet her. And so I called her mother and I said, bring her to Washington. She's not now gonna be able to meet the president. So we had that party for all these kids who loved President Reagan and uh, that gave me a lot of joy. It was the best party ever, rather than just having folks who know him or see him regularly, you know. Right. You can have your friends some other time. These are new friends. <laughs> well, tell us uh, how you got to meet Senator Bob Dole. And, oh, my. Uh, about, <laughs> about your early courtship <laughs> relationship. Do you think this is a fair question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I was working for Virginia Nower, and I'm, I'm a great believer in mentors, and she was my mentor. She was a wonderful person. She was... She was President Nixon's special assistant for consumer affairs, and I was her deputy. And so um, Virginia said, we need to go talk to the chairman of the Republican National Committee about a consumer plank in the platform. And I said, fine. You know, I didn't know who it was, actually. I was policy. I was not politics then. I was just not an active politician. I'm sorry to say at the Dole Institute of Politics, <laughs> but I became one later. <laughs> And so up we went, and we were sitting in Bob Dole's office, and he was on the Senate floor. And a little side door opened. He came in, and I looked up, and I thought, my, he's a good-looking man. <laughs> and he says he wrote my name on the back of his blotter. <laughs> and so, uh, and, he, and there was a plank in the platform, by the way. <laughs> so we, we got our work done. But I didn't see him then until there was an event in Washington later when an office was being opened for the party, and I was there and we waved to each other, and then I saw him at the convention. Well, about three weeks later, after the convention, he called, and he said, um, uh, well, first of all, we had a lot of mutual friends, mutual interests, and we had a great animated conversation for about 40 minutes, and he said goodbye. Didn't ask me for a date. And about two weeks later, he called, and we talked again for about 30 minutes, and it was a wonderful conversation. And he said, maybe we could have dinner sometime. And I said, that would be very nice. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> On the third call, he, he set the date. He, he asked me out to dinner. Now, I loved that. Do you know why? Because I knew he was a little shy, and he was not some man running, chasing women around Capitol Hill. And so I loved that about him. He's just a little shy. Yeah, yeah. That's great. and it, it, that's how we met. What, <laughs> what was it? Uh, what was it like when uh, you were campaigning for Senator Dole? How did that affect your career when he was running for president? Yeah. Well, this may be a bit of a long answer because that's I have to start right. back to the time he was nominated for the vice presidency. Uh, we had only been married six months when he was nominated for the vice presidency. And as I mentioned earlier, I was, I was a policy wonk then. I was not a politician. I was not involved in politics. And so here I am. I'm married to this man that I'm madly in love with, and we're sitting at the convention, and here he is all of a sudden, he's, and I'm up on the stage with him, and he's going to run for the vice president. And so I remember one of the national reporters with a microphone in my face asking me, are you going to have to resign from your position at the Federal Trade Commission? I said, well, we'll have to check that out. And I thought, will I have to resign? And I didn't know, Bob didn't know, the people at the convention didn't know, the White House didn't know. We don't think there'd ever been a political spouse in a presidentially appointed position until then, so it was a new issue. So what do you do? So the White House general counsel uh, reviewed everything, and he came back saying, you don't have to resign, but you do need to take a leave of absence. So I left the Federal Trade Commission to campaign with Bob. 
Then in 1987, uh, he, uh, he was anxious for me to leave the transportation department before there was one rule that I wanted to get out. You know about the airlines being on time and how much of your, how many complaints do you have against them and are they, how do they compare with other airlines on being on time? That's, that's my last rule. Yeah, and Bob kept saying, don't you want to support your husband for president? I said, yes, I have to get this rule out. It's one last rule. <laughs> so anyway, I'd left and I got some criticism at that time from women's organizations who said, why are you leaving your career? What are you doing? You're giving up your career to stand beside your husband and be the good little wife. And I said, my response was, no, this is my choice. And that's what I've always said. Women need to be able to decide what it is that's going to be best for them and for their families. And I said, I can't imagine saying goodbye, Bob, good luck, and I'll see you when it's over. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I wanted to be with him. And actually, it was one of the best career you know, it was not a paid position, but from a career standpoint, it was great because I was out there discussing issues, meeting the press. Um, I ultimately had my own plane and staff. And we went separate ways. And I remember, actually, when he was running for vice president, that Lynn Knopfziger was with my husband then. Some of you remember Lynn. And Lynn said, uh, there's no way the spouse can get any publicity. Elizabeth shouldn't travel separate from you because... It won't do anything, you know, it's, no. And I said, well, I think maybe we could help. And Bob said, let her just try it, let's see. And so I went out, and actually we ended up with a, uh, it was a uh, New Orleans newspaper. There were five pictures across the front on policy issues on, on the vice president's, a potential vice president's wife. So, so Bob said, that's it, Lynn, you know, we're going to send her out separately. But that was maybe the first time that that occurred, you know, that you could really get out there on, uh, on a separate track and help your husband with the issues. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I was the first, but it certainly wasn't uh, something that was done every day to, to get out on your own. Yeah. So let's see, in 87 then, I left the, I left the uh, Department of Transportation and I was the longest serving secretary at that time, so I felt I'd done my, my good deed there to stay five years. I didn't I have any hesitation about leaving, although the women's groups didn't understand it at first. Um, and then, let's see, in 96, when Bob uh, was the presidential nominee, um, of course, that meant I was still at the Red Cross. I took a leave of absence, and the board actually gave me a leave of absence for a year to campaign for Bob. And I thought if Bob won, and I expected that he would, that I might go back and serve. My work as First Lady would be serving as President of the American Red Cross. But it didn't happen. So I went back after the leave of absence. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, you don't really think about the fact that there's almost a separate career going along with my job career because I was supporting Bob in these different elections. And I traveled all the 50 states. I traveled the 99 counties of Iowa, not once, but twice. And I remember going from, from Puerto Rico to Alaska for Bob on one, one trip. So, you know, you were out there constantly in these campaign efforts, totally aside from what you were doing work-wise, but through leaves of absence in two cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The two of you together, we had you here in uh, 2009. Uh, yeah. The two of you together is so much fun. Is, is, is that how the relationship goes usually at home? <laughs> well, we, we have fun kind of, you know, poking at each other when we're doing a joint appearance. And so um, I'll, I'll have to share one with you. You're asking about at home. He's, he's still very funny at home. And it's not the same kind of rapport that you see if we're out on the stage together, you know, in terms of batting it back and forth. But, yes, he, he has that great sense of humor. But... Um, <laughs> We were, we were supposed to, to speak, let's see, this goes back now to my Federal Trade Commission days. Um, I, I, I needed a good speech topic. I was going to be speaking to um, American Advertising Federation, I believe it was, and I wanted a good speech topic. And at that time, there was a debate about whether or not to have a consumer protection agency in the federal government, and I thought it'd be a great idea. And this what they call the pink sheet, came across my desk at the FTC, and I read that Bob Dole is against the Consumer Protection Agency. 
And I thought, well, he didn't tell me that, you know. <laughs> so I called him and I said, Bob, I just had a great idea here. I'm, I'm disappointed you're not for the agency. And he said, well, they're, they're, you know, we, there are 18 of them already around Washington. I said, the whole idea is to bring them together into one uh, good organization instead of all this scattered approach. Well, anyway, I said, you've now given me a speech idea. Would you be willing to debate me on this issue before the American <laughs> Advertising Federation? And I'll never forget what he said. There was a pause, and he said, do you really need me? And I said, yes, I really need you. He said, all right, I'll do it. So we debated each other at this event, and I remember saying something like, he stopped by the Chamber of Commerce on the way in to get his speech, to pick up his speech. You know, we were going back and forth with each other. <laughs> so Good Morning America heard about this and asked us if we'd be on the program. Okay, I was at the Federal Trade Commission. I had a doctor's appointment. And instead of driving the car home, I went to the doctor's appointment in a taxi. And then I thought, I'll just tootle on home. The car was at the FTC. Okay, the next morning, it's time to rush up to the studio. I run down to the garage to get the car. There's no car. No car. So I go back up. Hurry, Bob, we've got to get a taxi. The car, I forgot the car. It's at the Federal Trade Commission. So we go running down the hall, out the front door of our apartment building, and there's a lady there waiting for a taxi. She's now a very best friend. And she said please take my taxi. I have plenty of time to get to the airport. Take my taxi. So we grabbed Marguerite's taxi and went flying up to the studio, went breathlessly on the set. And I'll never forget, <laughs> we, we had quite a debate. We really did. And uh, after this debate was over, I mean, it was friendly, but we were going at it, you know. <laughs> and so when it was over, we got a lot of mail. And there was a man who wrote to... Um, to, uh, to Bob and said, uh, you will, if you don't get your wife to shut her mouth, you'll never be reelected. <laughs> and there was a man who wrote to me and said, you're right, he's wrong, how could he have such a dumb opinion? <laughs> and then there was a third letter, a man who said, I do hope you'll soon be able to resolve your marital difficulties. <laughs> That's true. Those, those letters are probably right here at the Dole Institute. Now. Yeah, they're in the, all those boxes somewhere. Right. You've got all the mail. <laughs> You've been, uh, been a public servant for most of your life. How has politics changed from when you first got into it to today? Mm. Uh, well, um, I think, you know, Back in my early days, um, when I think about uh, the, well, of course, the Federal Trade Commission, I was in a regulatory agency. But uh, with President Reagan, um, it was incredible. I mean, he was, um, he, was, he was just such a strong leader, and um, he, made, he, he had a certain set of principles, and he just followed those principles, and he knew exactly where he was going. You know, peace through strength and all the, you can think of all the different things uh, that you recall that President Reagan stood for. And it was very clear what he stood for. Um, and I think that um, today, obviously, the Republican Party is divided. You've got uh, a debate within the Republican Party. Um, you have a situation where, no question about it, there's a major change in the, in the attitude in terms of how hip people in politics treat each other. Um, I, I am still shocked that we would have someone called a liar on the Senate floor by a colleague. You know, that never happened in Bob Dole's days. I mean, it just, there are just changes that have occurred. It's, things have gotten tense, and you, we've been through difficult times before, and we c will come out of it, but it seems now that there's a... Um, uh, 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 there's, there, there's a language that's being used that wasn't used in the past in terms of getting pretty sharp uh, with how you speak about your disagreements with another person, sharp elbows, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's too bad because that does not encourage young people to want to get involved in politics. So I think we, we need to be concerned about that, about just our, our attitude and the, the way we treat uh, colleagues in terms of keeping you know, keeping um, tough language off the Senate floor, for example. 
So that's a change that I, that I regret, but I think we will pull out of that and we'll, you know, hopefully we can bring folks together again. And that's critically important. I mean, you're not gonna get anything important done without finding the common ground, you know, bringing people together. Um, yes, they may have very opposite points of view, but you can always find common ground and we have to be willing to do that. And I'm happy that my foundation is a, an area where we can show how people um, from both parties work together because Nancy Pelosi is one of my strongest supporters. Um, and you know, Nancy has been right there every time we ask her to do something to help these hidden heroes, she's anxious to do it. She was willing to co-chair a congressional caucus uh, for military and veteran caregivers, along with John McCain, Susan Collins. Um, and she's had two events on the Hill for us. Um, and she's just there whenever you, whenever you need her. And same is true of Susan Collins and many of the Republicans. But, you know, that's an example of how beautifully it works when you've got both sides, uh, you know, on an issue with the, that you care about and you're passionate about. And certainly helping these uh, caregivers of those who have served our country. In fact, Tom Hanks, who's heading my awareness campaign, and I actually got uh, Tom because of Bob Dole, because Tom helped Bob with the World War II Memorial. And so I latched on to Tom then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's a great uh, asset. But Tom, Tom uh, called this the helping the hidden heroes. He said, this is the greatest love story ever told because it's a person who raises his hand or raises their hand, man or woman, to put themselves in harm's risk to help those that they don't know, to help other people, put themselves in harm's way to risk their lives. And then the story continues when another person gives, sets aside their life to care for that wounded warrior who has been uh, fighting for our freedom and our security. Greatest love story ever told. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the Elizabeth Dole Foundation now. Why did you start it, and what are your goals and objectives? Well, Bob was hospitalized at Walter Reed uh, National Military Medical Center for 11 months, about six years ago. And, of course, I was there constantly. Um, and I, I saw things that just uh, amazed me. Uh, the room next to him, there was a young spouse lying on a... Uh, a pallet on the floor by her husband's bed. He'd had both legs amputated above the knee. And she was there month after month as I was in and out of the hospital. And down the hall was Mrs. Stewart. She was from Mississippi. And her son was about to have his 40th operation. And so I began to take these caregivers, the mothers, fathers, the spouses, down to Washington to dinner just to get them out of the hospital room for a night. And of course, I was being drawn more and more into what was happening in their lives. And um, so by the time Bob left the hospital, uh, I was ready to start a foundation because you see it and you've got to do something about it. And I've, I've noticed that a number of people who are helping our wounded warriors, it comes from one experience being at Walter Reed or one of the other military hospitals. For me, imagine 11 months of it. And so you're committed. So um, the first thing we did was to uh, commission the RAND Corporation to uh, engage. We wanted them to do the first evidence-based national comprehensive research ever done on this population, military and veteran caregivers. And they did that, and it was amazing. The results that came back were incredible. Five and a half million military and veteran caregivers, if you look at all war eras. And they are... What they're doing, many of them are bathing, feeding, dressing the wounded. Uh, they are putting aside their careers to, to be caregivers full time. You think about a lot of these now are young people in their 20s and 30s because post 9-11, there are 1.1 million caregivers of just post 9-11. And we're still engaged in that war. We're on our 16th year. So you've got all these younger people coming back with problems. And then we found that in the home, taking care of the wounded, uh, they are trying to prevent triggers that would set off an emotional response because many of them have post-traumatic stress or, or uh, traumatic brain injury. Some can't even leave the house. And you think about the children. The children are wondering, is this my fault? Did I, did I, what did I do wrong? Uh, one is 
wounded, the other's taking care of the wounded, the children can't go to normal activities with other kids, they can't have anyone into their home for a sleepover, they have to tiptoe around the house to be sure they don't upset the wounded. Or you have, you know, if, if it's a physical wound, they're doing all kinds of medications, uh, they're handling all kinds of appointments with the doctor. Um, many of them now have to go into the workforce at least part-time because the caregiver is the sole breadwinner for the family. So they're caregiving, raising children, going in and out of work. It is the most unbelievable, challenging situation. It really is. And most Americans have no idea what's going on in military homes today. So raising awareness is a, a part of our mission. Let's let America know what's happening here. And then more importantly, we have to come up with solutions to their tremendous challenges. Um, and we're doing that. We have a, a coalition of about 300 organizations. Um, and Tom Hanks, as I mentioned, is the Hidden Heroes uh, uh, national chairman. And this is a, a three-year effort, uh, or multi-year, maybe longer than three years. <laughs> but we'll, we'll be doing everything we can uh, to raise awareness and to come up with those solutions. Now, we have a new project called Hidden Heroes Cities. Uh, and I believe that Mayor Leslie Sodom may be in the audience this morning. Leslie, are you here? If you are, raise your hand. <laughs> Can't see all the way back there. But uh, she has, uh, has made Lawrence, Kansas a hidden hero city. And we're very pleased. This means that she'll be, have a group of people who are working together to find caregivers in the community, to determine what resources are available in Lawrence to help these uh, military caregivers, how can we extend those resources? And if we don't have the right resources, how are we going to come up with them? But the main thing is finding the caregivers. There are now 93 cities from uh, San Francisco to Chicago to New York to New Orleans, Salisbury, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're building that Hidden Heroes uh, community. Mm -hmm. We are so very excited to have the your collection here at the Dole Institute. I think we have about half of it. What was it like going back through all of that and, and <laughs> spending some time with that as you prepared that to, to ship it out to us? It has been amazing. And I, I want to give credit to Gia Colombraro right over here, my executive assistant. Gio, Gia has done a marvelous job helping with all these papers. And you know we were trying to at least sort it for you according to jobs. Because you don't, you don't want to get all of this. You don't want to have FTC with, with Red Cross, you know. So. We appreciate that. <laughs> but you, you, you know, you're thinking back to so many things that have happened, a lot of laughs, some tears as well, you know, as, as different things. You think, oh, my goodness, I'd forgotten about that. And, and so it's been kind of an emotional experience. But it, I'll share one with you because actually... Um, this is the 20th year since Princess Diana passed away. And there are going to be some stories written about this. Um, and so let me share with you one that, that was a kind of an emotional one as I thought about this, um, going through my papers. Um, I was working at the Red Cross on trying to help landmine victims, victims of these unbelievable tragedies, the landmines. And so uh, Diana happened to be working on the same thing with the British Red Cross. And so we, we got to know each other through my senior vice president who had been uh, with her in England. And so she came to the United States. We had a gala to raise money for land, landmine victims. And uh, I let the palace know, because this is important, you know, she was going to have about 300 press people following her. And so I said, um, I will be wearing a lavender suit and during the day, and that night, a green chiffon evening gown. We let them know. Promise. Princess Diana walked into my office at the Red Cross in a lavender suit. <laughs> I'm sitting there in my lavender suit. It's even the same shade of lavender. And so we begin discussing landmine victims. We're talking about all the things that might be done. I'm saying the Red Cross, you know, has a, a, a center in Cambodia for landmine victims. We're talking about that. And so then, and of course, we have assistants with us. And so I paused for a moment in the middle of the conversation. And I said, you know, I live about 10 minutes from here. And I said, I think that I can slip out without the press knowing where I'm going 
and I can make it to my home and change to a different suit. And she said, oh, thank goodness. And everybody <laughs> said, you know, everybody just stopped their discussion. Yes, great, you know. And I said, you all just continue the discussion, and I'm going to slip out and try to avoid your press, <laughs> all this huge number of press. So I go flying to my house, and all the way I'm saying, dear Lord, please let me have, let me have the yellow suit or this other suit that has the same shoes, the same pocketbook, the same earrings, the same everything, so I can change in about two minutes. Please don't let it be at the dry cleaner, you know. <laughs> and fortunately, there was a yellow suit there that I could slip into quickly, got back in within 10 minutes, went back into the landmine meeting, and the press never knew a thing. So we walked out, and there's a picture somewhere that you already have, I think. Diana's in her lavender suit, and I'm in the yellow. We're walking out to the garden, and that's where we met the press and answered their questions. And that was of two months before she passed away. That was her last trip to the United States. And that, that comes up uh, for, you know, there'll be some stories and all this year in the next couple of months, I think. Mm -hmm. But that certainly was one to remember as I was getting the papers ready for the Dole Institute. Right. I have uh, one final question, then we'll open it up to audience questions and answers. Um, my final question is, we have a lot of young people, you got to meet quite right. a few of them earlier, wonderful. involved in the Dole Institute. What advice would you give to those students, especially the young women, mm -hmm. about the importance of being involved in public service? Oh my goodness. Uh, if, if they're not involved, that means half of our population, talented, educated, wonderful people, are not involved in, in the future of our country. So it's essential that women be involved. And you know, there's a recent study uh, this year from uh, American University Institute of Women and Politics that indicates that women are uh, much less likely than men to feel that they're qualified to run for office. And that the political parties are not reaching out to women as much as they should be. And that uh, they're, they're really not, uh, not encouraging women to run. And yet the same institute found that when women do run, they, they are very good at, at winning the job. <laughs> you know, w once they make the decision to run, uh, they are very capable of winning that seat. So uh, I think it's important that women uh, become involved at the local level. When, in state legislatures, that's where we had to have the path feeding up to the United States Congress. But right now, only, I think it's 19% um, of the House is female and 21% of the Senate. And this is far behind most Western democracies. Now, when you think about how, you, let me put this into a little bit of a pattern here just quickly, because obviously we want more women running and I think becoming involved in a local election, you know, so that you find out sort of how this is done, you get to, you make some contacts, you get experience, and that's a great way to start out. Um, but did you realize that women have not even had the vote in the United States for 100 years? When I was finishing Duke University, this was 1958, women had only had the right to vote for 38 years. Isn't that amazing? So you start there. In 1935, a law was passed, the National Recovery Act, that required that women in the same position as men in government must make 25% less than men. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's amazing. And then along we come to Duke University when I finished and, and very few women were thinking about going into careers in my class at Duke. Then we get to the point that I'm talking with Margaret Chase Smith, working with, for one of my senators from North Carolina for a summer job in 1960. Margaret Chase Smith is just down the hall. She was very kind to agree to let me come in and be, uh, have an interview with her. And she shared with me that she had just been with a group of female journalists. And they had asked her, Senator Smith, how would you feel if you woke up one morning and found yourself at the White House? She paused and she said, well, I told them I'd go right away to the president's wife and I'd apologize and then I'd go home. <laughs> That's where we were in 1960, you know? Isn't that amazing? 
And then I go to the transportation department and I have to establish a women's program because we have only 19% female. And I said, when this department, that's 1983, when this department was established in 1967, how many women were there? 18.5%. I said, you mean from 1927 to, to 19, um, am I getting my n numbers right? I'm getting confused. To 1983, there were only, there was only a half a percentage point? Yeah. So we set up a 10-point program, how to encourage women, you know, give them the reward structures, rotational assignments. If you're at the Railroad Administration, maybe you better go, go over to the Federal Highway Administration, broaden your horizons. Um, so, you know, you, you have to do everything possible to encourage and, and help women during that period. Um, and then at the Red Cross, imagine this. I went to the Red Cross in 1991. I was the first woman to head the organization since Clara Barton in 1881. 1881 to 1991, the American Red Cross had two women presidents. <laughs> so, you know, we're making progress. I don't mean for this to be a downer. <laughs> but it is amazing when you look at the history and the fact that we are, we've not even really had the right to vote for 100 years, almost there, but... But I do see, you know, so many talented women are coming into the workforce now, no question about it. Um, and the numbers are increasing. But we still have a ways to go. I mean, there's, you know, there's still a form of um, subtle discrimination in some ways. So we're not there yet. <laughs> we haven't reached our millennium yet. Senator Dole, I'd like to thank you for um, being a groundbreaker for women. And I'm a 41-year-old woman and uh -huh. consider myself sort of um, amazed as I sit here and listen to all of the accomplishments that you've made over what seems to me um, not really that long ago now. Um, but when I was younger and they were happening, I don't really feel like I fully appreciated them. So I apologize oh. if I'm a little emotional, but oh, bless you. Um, I really you. have uh, enjoyed our time today. My Thank name is you. Casey Toomey, and I'm an assistant city manager for the city of Lawrence, and I brought the proclamation today oh, that you mentioned um, that proclaimed Lawrence a hidden hero city, and I wanted to make sure and get it to you before you left um, this afternoon. So thank you again for all uh, that you've done for our country and um, for women in leadership positions. Oh, thank, so thank you, you so, so much. much. And I appreciate what Lawrence is doing. Thank you for being here today. I look forward to seeing that proclamation. <laughs> Okay, we have a question in the back. Uh, could you tell us about what impacted you most during your experience in the Senate? I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, the greatest impact on you during your experience in the Senate. The greatest impact on me. Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, I think uh, the opportunity to, to really get to know a number of my fellow senators, because normally you really have very little opportunity unless you're working on a committee with someone, because the Senate will tend to, to adjourn on Thursday or, or Friday, early Friday, and not be back in until Monday night, and there's not a lot of time to really get to know your colleagues. And I think that this is one of the things, we, had, we found ways of trying to really relate to one another um, because that's how you really get things done. Um, you've got to be able to, to have those friendships, have those relationships, um, and if, if people are constantly you know, leaving and, and spending so few hours uh, uh, in Washington, so few days, it's really hard to get to know your colleagues. And we did make, a group of us made a really special effort to try to, to meet regularly, uh, we had a, a Senate Bible study together. We also had uh, the women uh, tried to get together often. Uh, Barbara Mikulski was a big uh, proponent of the women having dinner together at least one night a week. And uh, so we look for ways to, to really get to know one another. And it's so much easier to resolve problems if you do have a friendship or some knowledge of other people rather than just sitting down with the person that is almost a total stranger because you've had no relationship except the few committee uh, opportunities. So I think you have to make that extra push to find those other ways of getting together. And of course, some of my really good friends go back to those days now, no question. Mm -hmm. And that's true of all the positions. There are people, in fact, one of the most fun things to do is to meet with folks from that era or any other era 
and just share stories and laugh about the funny things that happened and maybe share something that you wish it had happened but it didn't, you know, just to, to relate to one another and continue the friendships. Okay, I have a question right here. Hello, Senator. Thank you for Hi. coming. Uh -huh. um, there's been a lot written about how men and women communicate differently, mm. and especially in the workplace. What tips do you have for how women can communicate effectively in a professional life and be taken seriously, get their points across, and get their points across? Right. Well, I think for one thing, we must not be uh, hesitant to speak up. You know, women need to raise their hands in, in school. Don't sit at the back of the room, sit up near the front, raise your hand, be a part of it. <laughs> and certainly that's true uh, in other positions as well. But I think that, you know, we women tend to, um, tend not to want to take risks as much as men do. And we second guess ourselves. Now, I'm good on the risk-taking. I've never had a problem with that. Uh, but I think that is something that traditionally women have had little, they've been more hesitant to take risks than men. But I'm, I'm certainly one of those who does second-guess myself. <laughs> because I'll go back after something and uh, when I've been uh, engaged in something and I'll think, now, did I, did I do that the, the most articulate way that I could have? And I remember years ago, Bill, talking with a man uh, over lunch and I made the statement that women-owned businesses were hiring more employees than all the Fortune 500 combined worldwide. He said, oh, that can't be true. That cannot be true. And so we kind of debated it. And of course, I went back and second-guessed myself. I was right. But you know, that's an example of how you, oh my, maybe, uh, maybe I mishandled uh, uh, that. So I think we do tend to, to do that. And we need to get over that. And I think that women, just like any person who's going to be a great leader, uh, we need to have that moral compass, that set of values, uh, that uh, honesty, um, uh, integrity. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to have consistent decisions without it, and uh, you're not going to inspire confidence uh, and tr trust in you without that kind of approach. So that moral compass is absolutely key. And then finding that which you feel passionately about, because that will just start you on the, on the road to, uh, to doing a great job, because you care, you, your heart is with it, you're very much into it. And of course, communication skills are so valuable. If I had it to do over again, I would have taken debating at Duke. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, skill. But public speaking is great. Um, and you know, having those communication skills, and I worry today about young people so buried in their all of their you know tools, as I call them, <laughs> because I want people to communicate across the room. I don't want them talking to each other in that way. <laughs> and in developing interpersonal skills is just uh, very important. And I'm afraid that some of our young people may not getting the tr get, be getting the training they need because they're so buried in in texting and, you know, emailing. <laughs> uh, thanks again for coming. Um, Surely. So you've mentioned some of the mentors that you've had throughout your career. Uh, for those of us just getting started in our careers, what are some steps that you would suggest we take to seek out mentors and build relationships? Well, I think, you know, depending on what's, what you're interested in, but finding people uh, in your school or in your community uh, who, who are uh, engaged in the field that you're interested in uh, for example, I was interested in political science. And so for a summer job, um, I went to my senator, to Senator Jordan. I didn't know him at all, but I, I went to him and I applied for the position. And I think, you know, don't take no for an answer, too. I mean, sometimes you have to just keep looking for a while. But I remember uh, there are a couple of instances where I just refused to take no for an answer. One was I wanted to work for a summer at the UN as a guide. And I was told, oh, no, they don't take any summer people. Um, and you have to have five languages. And I thought, I'm just going to drop by there anyway when I'm in New York. <laughs> and so I went by, and they said, oh, you want to be a summer intern? Yes, we need summer interns. Well, do I, how many languages do I need? One, English. <laughs> and I thought, you know, you get this information, well, go check it out, you know. Don't take no for an answer. <laughs> and it may not work, but at least try, right? <laughs> uh, but um, I remember, too, 
Um, I wanted to work for, you, I think uh, the chancellor mentioned my working for uh, Lyndon Johnson. Well, I wanted to work with, for Betty Furness, who was the consumer advisor. Do you remember Betty? Do you? Okay. And so I went to, to see Betty, and Les Dix was her, uh, her deputy. And uh, Les said, um, you know, we'd love to, to put you on, but we just have no positions. There are no positions. Well, I was then working over at the Department of Health and Human Services, a, old HHS. And so in the cafeteria was the head of the FDA, and he and I had sort of gotten to know each other, just chatting. And so I went over to him one day and I said, do you ever put people on your payroll and, and send them to another position? <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, that happens a lot in government. And I said, would you be willing to hire me and send me over to the White House Consumer Office? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was just getting to know him in the lunchroom at the HHS. And so I ended up working for Betty Furness off of the HHS payroll. <laughs> oh, okay, we have a question right here. Thank you again, Senator, for being here. Surely. You were willing to put yourself out to run for president, and there have been other women who've attempted it in the U.S. What is it going to take for us to have our first woman president? <laughs> well, I, I think we're close. I really do. I think we're close. Um, and a lot of progress has been made, but it is astounding that the United States, again, is behind other Western areas, you know? Uh, but again, you know, I go back to this, the period that I went through, 1920, 1935, you know, my, my graduation from Duke in 1958 and how, you know, women just were really not pursuing careers so much. Uh, and so we've been, it's been a gradual change. Uh, but I do think, and, and you know, Hillary Clinton worked very hard. She put a tremendous amount of effort into her campaign. And, um, and I, I give her a lot of credit for coming to the inauguration, for taking what was, was really a, a shock for her, I'm sure. But she, she made, made a lot of progress in terms of pushing that ball down the road. Um, and I do think that it won't be long until we'll have a, a woman president of the United States. In my case, I started too late. I'm not saying I would have won anyway, but um, I, I started in 1999 and I was, again, at the Red Cross trying to finish a project in the blood program. And I should have left earlier. And Bob kept urging me to leave. And I was still making up my mind if I was going to do this. And so uh, by the time I left, uh, you know, George Bush was coming out of the governor's office. He had a fundraising operation. He had a political operation. I was coming out of the American Red Cross, which is absolutely bipartisan. And I had no fundraising operation for politics. We did a great job fundraising for the Red Cross, but not political fundraising. And so right there, you've got two strikes against you. But I beat Al Gore in all the polls in 1999. <laughs> and then I came in third in the Iowa straw poll. So maybe if I'd left a year earlier, I would have had a, a fairly decent shot at it. But um, so timing is important, too. No question. OK, we have a question right here. Hi, I'm a volunteer with Community Access Television in Salina, so that's why I'm on the camera. But um, I, I wanted to tell you that I worked for your husband when he first ran for president years and years ago doing a little bit of data entry. And when I applied to Yale University, I didn't get in, but he was kind enough to write me a letter of recommendation, and he had never met me. So I just wanted to tell, tell you that. But what, what are that's your thoughts nice. about the, um, you. in the last, what, four or five years, the moves to change the Senate rules on judiciary confirmations? I, I wish that it hadn't happened. I wish that it hadn't happened. But, you know, be that as it may, I mean, we're where we are. Uh, but I would, I would have preferred that the Senate rules stay as they were. But it started, you know, Harry Reid began that. And um, I, it, it shouldn't, I wish that none of it had happened. Okay, we have a question back here. Thank you so much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Um, oh, thank what you. do you think is the biggest problem facing this country, and what can we do to fix it? The biggest problem? Yes. And what to do to fix it? In this country. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you're not. <laughs> Lori. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> 
Well, obviously, um, there, there are a number of problems. Um, certainly, the health care issue is a major problem right now. Uh, the immigration problem, uh, you know, we've got to, we've got to, people have got to know where they stand on these issues. And certainly, uh, the economy, I've, it, you know, to get this country really moving again, to create jobs, let me take that one, uh, because there's no question that a lot of people need work and they need better work. And the idea is to, to free up from a lot of the regulations. We are, we are excessively involved in regulations right now. And businesses cannot, they don't know what the tax policy is. And so they're hesitant to expand their businesses, to hire more people, um, to get new equipment and all the rest because they don't know what the policy, tax policies are. And so we need to move forward to cut back on excessive regulations. Uh, and, uh, you know, tax policy, we probably need to do it incrementally, but to start with the corporate tax, we have the highest corporate tax of any country. We are the highest. And that means that a lot of uh, business is going offshore, and we need to, to get the economy under control. I think that's got to be a major issue, but I, I'm hesitant to single out one. <laughs> and certainly, if we're looking beyond our borders, uh, the, the issues with ISIS and, uh, I mean, the world's on fire, let's face it. The world is on fire, and there's so many issues there. And, uh, of course, I think President Reagan had such a great way of going about that issue with peace through strength. And I believe that uh, President Trump is doing the right thing to build our military. And John McCain was just on television this morning talking about how, how, uh, how much we need new equipment in the military uh, the problems with our ships, with, their, with our aircraft, all kinds of issues that he discussed uh, very articulately this morning. So that's, that's a major one. But uh, health care, immigration, certainly um, I think we'll be seeing some action. But, you know, you can't do it in the first 100 days. I think this goes back, all this talk about the first 100 days, believe me, that goes back to FDR, to Franklin Roosevelt. And that was a very, very different picture. Now, major issues like you're talking about, you're not going to get it done in 100 days. In fact, my feeling would be you'd better do it a lot more carefully than trying to do it in 100 days because there are all sorts of things to iron out. You've got the House with their legislation, the Senate with theirs trying to reconcile. I mean, it takes a lot of hard work to take on those major issues, and it just can't be done overnight or even over 100 nights in most cases. Okay, we have another question in the back. Um, thank you for coming once again. Thank you. Um, I'm curious your thoughts about the political infighting in both parties in Washington and how it's leading to difficulties getting stuff done. Well, I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's a, a real problem. We have been through difficult problems before, and we'll come out of this one too. But right now, there's, there's such animosity and, uh, you know, I think I mentioned to the students earlier just the idea of someone, um, you know, calling a, another senator a liar on the Senate floor. I mean, there's a tone uh, that's developed that's very uh, obnoxious. <laughs> and so just trying to bring people together, um, as I mentioned, my foundation is an, an opportunity for us to see Democrats and Republicans working together on many of the issues that involve our, our veterans and their families. And... Uh, you just have to find the common ground. But right now, the Republican Party is divided, and the Democratic Party, you know, I think there's division there, too. There's some who are accepting what's happened and others who are still um, just can't believe that Hillary lost, and they're not, not willing to accept it, and, and uh, we get all this uh, trying to, frankly, trash the president on the part of some people. That doesn't help anything, you know? because we have to respect the position of President of the United States. So um, I'm very concerned about the tone of things today. Mm -hmm. And in terms of bringing it together, it takes people like Bob Dole, you know, who was a man of principle and character and who would never say, I've never heard, believe it or not now, I've been married to him almost 42 years, I have never heard a four-letter word from that man. Never. Never. <laughs> I have time for one more question if somebody wants to shoot their hand up real fast, and if you don't, 
you're going to lose your opportunity. <laughs> Students, anybody else? Okay, well, actually, we're going to do two back here. We had two hands go up at the same time. That'll be it then. <laughs> Hello, Senator Dole. Uh, I just wanted to say I really loved your blue dress from earlier. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, I had to change. You know why? I noticed. <laughs> I couldn't, there was no way to hook the microphone on my oh. blue outfit. <laughs> you have to be flexible. That's a, yeah. I, I'm glad you said that rather than I was wearing the same blue suit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking on bipartisanship, you, you mentioned like changing the tone, but what, what more uh, effective ways can we enforce like bipartisanship among Congress? Like what do we need to do? Is it, is it uh, rested upon people in Congress, like the individuals there, or how do we inspire them to work effectively with each other? Good well, question. yeah, it certainly is. And I think that <clears throat> there, um, I think that, that, that Mitch McConnell has, has been concerned about some of the language on the Senate floor, remember? Mm -hmm. So, but um, I, I, it's a matter of, of trying to, through, um, through people working together, um, just being able to, for example, the women in the Senate, I think when we met in Senator, Senator Mikulski's uh, evenings, we would take on issues that we felt were of concern to the Senate. And we would try to, through our various committee assignments and the work that we were doing with various members of the Senate, we'd try to convey um, our concerns about that. And I think that, um, that the women can be a, a, a good voice in that respect. And, uh, and it's a matter of, I think people will realize that you're not going to really see much action. You're not going to be able to tell your folks back home what you've accomplished if you're not able to work in an amicable way with your colleagues. And so pretty soon it'll be obvious that we're not getting anything done. Nothing is really moving if we're fighting with each other and using uh, unattractive language and all the rest. You've got to be able to, to let your colleagues know what you're accomplishing. And if the work is not getting done and it's not moving forward, which won't happen unless you have some uh, coming together and finding a, a, a core in which you can agree. I don't know, Bill, do you have any thoughts here <laughs> as well, to how we can bring people back together in terms of their, their uh, attitudes and their you know, showing respect for each other? I mean, I think what we're doing here at the Dole Institute and what all of our student advisory board are learning is to have respect for other points right. of view. And uh, I think everyone on our advisory board has a very strong <laughs> partisan perspective, and yet they all get along great. Right. And that's what we emphasize here. So we just got to pump out enough of them, you know, once we get up to about, <laughs> once we get up to about 20 million former <laughs> SAB members, you'll start to see things. <laughs> they're actually already in D.C. and they're actually already changing things. All so, right. That's, yeah. that's a great point. And, and, you know, some of the senators that I've met recently, too, who, who are concerned about this as they come into the Senate and they see something they don't like. Uh, Tom Cotton, for example, I met with him recently. Um, and uh, I think there's a concern on the part of some of the new members that, hey, what is this, you know? And it, it, wasn't, it didn't used to be that way, so we've got to pull it back get people working together again. But like I say, if you're not accomplishing anything, and if you're a member of Congress, you want to accomplish things, and you want to be able to tell the people back home, and you're not going to get it done if you can't work amicably and find common ground. <coughs> so to me, that's the key. OK, we're going to take one more question back here at the back. <laughs> Make it a good one now. <laughs> Thank you. In the spirit right. of public service, um, I know there are a lot of students here. What would you say to someone um, who was approached by an individual, perhaps with a disability, um, and you knew you were probably one of the only people who could help them with a major problem, but you just didn't have the resources yet? You know, you didn't have the foundation, the business, um, or maybe necessarily the kind of financial aid to give them. Um, how would you tell students to help people with these huge problems um, when there is no organization created to kind of back the issue? So you're speaking of people with disabilities who need financial resources, and how can students help them? Yes. Well, um, people with disabilities. First of all, I would suggest uh, that you become aware there are a number of organizations that can certainly be helpful. 
Um, and I had a lovely thing happen when the students raised some money for my foundation and presented me with a check this morning. And so, you know, you, you all can be darn good fundraisers, I bet, uh, maybe um, getting out into the community or uh, thinking about opportunities you have back home or, or here in Lawrence uh, to try to uh, bring that issue to people. But you need to, to highlight what it is. People have got to feel it. It's, you know, you need to do it from the heart, as I th think you're doing right now. You need to explain what's, what's happening with this person with disability and, and the issues that they're dealing with. I remember when my husband came back from Kansas, actually, he'd been speaking with the Kansas Bankers Association, and two young people were brought to him, and they, they needed money to go to another state because um, they had a terrible disability. Uh, one of them was, it was almost like he was on a board and he could move nothing but his eyes. And Bob came back and he was so upset about that. And he said, Elizabeth, they were trying to talk to me. And I was on my way in to the banker's meeting and they were urging me to get in because I was late for the speech. And he said, I made them wait while I talked to these two young people. Bob Dole came home and started a foundation to help people with disabilities because of those two students out here in Kansas. So there's one person who was in a position to try to help, and I think that, you know, we need to talk with adults uh, who are in a position to have funds coming in and try to convey them uh, to them the necessities. Um, and that happens on a fairly regular basis, that we, we have cases presented to us, and I'm constantly trying to reach out to people who can help. Someone, uh, doctors, for example, will do pro bono work sometimes, um, and I'm doing that with a person right now. Um, you know, so th you just have to be creative in thinking, okay, who do I know? Or who do my parents know? Or, or, or maybe here in the Lawrence community, <laughs> since we have a wonderful representative here today, <laughs> maybe the mayor knows some people who could help, right? <laughs> so I hope that answers your question, but I think you just have to be creative, really. And um, it's wonderful that you have a heart for trying to help. And I'm sure that you will succeed, and probably you've got a room full of people right now who are gonna ask you to, to tell them more about this person. In fact, I'd like to know. <laughs> Very good. Senator Dole, thank you so much. For you are most us. welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, thank you.